And so now we're going to be discussing the principles and philosophy of my specialty, family medicine, and particularly how that applies to the United States medical licensing examination, because I think it is important to understand some of the background. It will influence uh, the types of answers that you, uh, that you see on, on the exam, and, the, and I believe the answers you get right. So I'm going to start with a quote, uh, and I'm going to read it, and then we're going to come back to some key points. In the increasingly fragmented world of healthcare, one thing remains constant. Family physicians are dedicated to treating the whole person. Family medicine's cornerstone is an ongoing, personal patient-physician relationship focusing on integrated care. Now that comes from our, our Academy of Family Physicians, and I just want to focus on a few of the key elements in that, um, in that statement. First of all, family medicine is highly personal. We follow patients over time, and our specialty is really based on good communication principles and empathy. Uh, we order fewer tests, uh, we uh, order fewer expensive procedures, um, stakeholders in medicine really love us, and I'm talking about governments, I'm talking about insurance companies, uh, because we provide quality care, uh, we improve morbidity, we also improve mortality substantially, and we do so at a low cost. Why? Because it starts with the patient. The patient is at the center of what we do. And so good communication skills uh, with the patient and bringing out all of their history and treating the patient in the context of their values and what's available to them is very important to us. So in that same vein, we embrace the biopsychosocial model of healthcare. So let's break down that word, biopsychosocial. So the bio, uh, the patient has diabetes and heart failure and generalized anxiety disorder. That's they have th these different disease states the uh, psychological. So they have anxiety and maybe that's related to the fact that their kid isn't doing so well in school and they're having trouble at their job and maybe they've been drinking a little bit more than they normally would with alcohol. So um, that's the, the psychological. And then the social. I mentioned how the, the impact of their child's uh, educational status uh, may be hurting their health in terms of their mental health. Maybe it's also leading to some poor control of diabetes, particularly if they're drinking more alcohol. And see how it all ties together. Um, every patient ties these different domains. They're all highly interrelated. And you can't really, I think, fully understand one domain without understanding the others. And that's, a, that's an important principle of our entire specialty. And we put the patient in the context of their relationships. So I mentioned uh, this uh, fictitious patient um, and her son. Um, so maybe I'm seeing not just, the, just that patient, but I'm also seeing her son and her husband and her aunt. Uh, and that allows me to get a more complete picture about what's going on uh, within this you know, family unit. And I'm also thinking about where she lives, um, what kind of um, options for health habits she has. Does she live in a food desert? Uh, is there any green space next to her? And so it's putting the patient in the context of their, their human relationships and also uh, the relationships to society at a larger level. We are holistic. Uh, we do cradle to grave uh, care and it's complete. Uh, we treat acute illness, uh, we do chronic illness, and we do preventive care too. And we'll see examples of that uh, throughout these uh, discussions I'm doing today. And then finally, we do focus on preventive care. So it's not just about treating disease, it's about promoting wellness. So that's one, I think that particularly when it comes to preventive care, uh, family medicine really owns that subject. Of course, with our patients with these many disease states, as I mentioned, uh, there's going, they're gonna see different specialists, they're gonna see different um, healthcare providers such as say physical therapy, they may be going to um, alternative care resources. Our job is to act as a central station where we're organizing that care and putting the patient at the center of a team of healthcare providers. But we have to be the ones to coordinate that care. Uncoordinated care is always wasteful, inefficient, and can be actually quite dangerous too. And so, and when I say we put the patient at the center, it's their values and their practices and their beliefs, what they are desiring to do, what they absolutely won't accept, that dictates uh, what we do as, as providers. And as I mentioned, uh, we are cheap. Uh, we're driven mostly by history and physical examination. And we do um, uh, take ownership of the, of the whole patient. I, I really uh, feel like I, I, I provide a certain paternalistic uh, style of care. 
Um, it's hard for me not to, uh, in which I, I really, I cheer on the patient's successes uh, when they lose five kilograms, um, when they get their A1C under control, when those tension headaches finally go away, when they get a promotion at their job. Um, and and I, I definitely mourn uh, when they have difficulties, when they uh, lose their home, uh, when their heart failure is getting out of control and we can't do much about it, um, when they're diagnosed with cancer. Um, I really own all of those conditions, but I also own to, to a large extent, I think some, some of the emotional component of, of those moments with my patient. And I think that's what makes medicine that much more real and worthwhile. All right, so let's do some cases because, you know, I, I'm sure you're wondering, how are we going to tie this back to USMLE exams? Um, we can, don't worry. I'm going to talk about some of the, how these principles actually play out in case scenarios, which are those case stems are what you're going to see on USMLE and how you can answer in an evidence-based and empathic way uh, for some of these issues. So I've got a 55-year-old man, history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, constant dull pain over his left chest for two weeks. A little bit more history, it does not radiate and it's not associated with other complaints such as shortness of breath or nausea and vomiting. His vital signs and his physical examination are normal. What's the next best step in this case? Is it A, inquire whether the pain changes with physical activity, B, order an electrocardiogram straight away, C, nuclear stress study, or D, serum D dimer level? And the answer is A. Now, we have some history here, and it's interesting because it's, it's a man who's got um, some chest pain. He's got all, all the major cardiovascular risk factors um, in terms of chronic illness, but it's a constant, constant dull pain for two weeks. That doesn't tell me that this is necessarily angina, which should come and go. And of course, the critical issues, does it come and go and get worse with exercise? And that's why the answer is A. It also doesn't radiate, it's not associated with other complaints that you, know, you might see with angina, shortness of breath, nausea or vomiting, um, and it's, it's physical exams all normal. So the next best step in this case is let's get more history. We are a history-driven specialty uh, if you want to be patient-centered. Does he need an electrocardiogram, option B? Uh, probably, but not before we get more history uh, because there's, there's a lot to be left uh, to be discovered in this case just with history alone uh, for risk stratification. And certainly I'd want that stratification done before I order either a nuclear stress study uh, to check his coronary arteries or a serum D dimer level because I'm worried about a pulmonary embolus, which this sounds nothing like a pulmonary embolus. So that's some of the principles playing out here is that in general, uh, if you think about these questions and case stems from a family medicine perspective, uh, getting more history of observation are generally going to be more profitable answers for you, and it's evidence-based care as well. All right, let's do another one. How about low back pain? 62-year-old woman complains of low back pain for three weeks in duration. She has occasional radiation of the pain down her right posterior thigh. Over-the-counter analgesics and stretching have been moderately helpful for the pain and her physical examination is unremarkable. So a limited history, limited case stem, what should you do for this patient now? A, order plain radiography of the lumbar spine. B, order an MRI of the lumbar spine. C, prescribe a muscle relaxant. Or D, continue current therapy and consider a referral to physical therapy. So let's see, thinking like a family doctor, uh, the answer is D. So she's getting some moderate relief. The pain's been going on for three weeks, uh, which is a, a good duration. But we know that the vast majority of low back pain, even when it involves sciatica, improves significantly within two months. And so therefore, probably just more time, possibly with the addition of an evidence-based uh, treatment like physical therapy, would be the best option for her. It's too early to uh, think about doing imaging. Um, I only would think about imaging uh, for somebody with back pain when I'm really thinking about doing something uh, more interventional, like referring them on for injection therapy or even surgery. Uh, so, and, and if she has no red flags on physical examination, no reason to, to order imaging at this time. Muscle relaxants, um, don't, they are highly sedating. 
Um, they don't really have a strong therapeutic indication, and therefore I would probably stick with what she's doing now because it is moderately successful and the physical therapy might help as well. All right, let's do one more case. I've got a 40-year-old woman with lots of complaints, headache, lightheadedness, blurry vision, dull abdominal pain, pedal edema, and generalized weakness all for two weeks. So just with that brief history alone, and your mind should be swimming now trying to put all those complaints together. If it's swimming, that's, that's good. Mine's swimming too. Which of the following interventions is most likely to be helpful in this case? A, MRI of the brain. Uh, B, an erythrocyte sedimentation rate or SED rate. C, an evaluation for psychosocial stressors. Or D, thyroid function testing. Were you able to draw a singular diagnosis that can, that can link all those different complaints together? I think it's a real challenge. I mean, there certainly are um, some, you know, inc rare uh, types of problems uh, that could that could link all those together. Um, multiple sclerosis, uh, but I still can't explain the edema, uh, uh, porphyria. Uh, so, but these are so rare, especially in a 40-year-old, you know, assuming pre previously healthy woman, um, that I would really start to wonder. You know, maybe there's an inciting event that brought all these various complaints on at, at once, and maybe it's just a reaction of stress. Maybe it's a somatization uh, disorder. Um, that's going to be the most likely when you have disparate complaints like this. And this is where that biopsychosocial model of healthcare really helps me out. I'm not going to rush to do uh, testing, whether it's uh, something specific like an MRI of the brain or something that's very vague and just trying to find some kind of inflammation with an erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Get more history here, and maybe, there, maybe, this, uh, maybe this patient is about to lose her job. Uh, maybe she is worried about a family member or there's been a family crisis. Uh, there's, a there's a million things that can promote uh, this spectrum of uh, symptoms and do so acutely. And then working through that, once you find that there is indeed uh, some serious stressor in this patient, working through that is going to be a lot more effective than doing blind testing or blind treatment as well. So with that, I, I hope that, that those cases give you an understanding of how we apply some of those principles of family medicine to our practice on an everyday level and can help you to provide better answers, more correct answers, on your assembly exam. Thanks.